Hey guys, here we are for chapter 17, section two. Today, we're gonna to talk about nuclear energy. Your essential question, what are three advantages and three disadvantages of nuclear energy? Let's just sort of dive right in and see what we have. Nuclear energy. This came about really in World War II. Oppenheimer, uh, them coming up with the atomic bomb. And in the 50s and the 60s, nuclear power plants were kind of seen as the power source of the future because the fuel was clean and plentiful. Clean in that it doesn't give off any pollutants, no carbon dioxide, we're not burning anything. Now in the 70s and 80s, however, many of the planned nuclear reactor plants were canceled and actually a lot of others that were under construction were just abandoned. Today, nuclear power is only about 14% of the world's energy. Now, you know, once again, compare that to in America, you know, 45% from coal, pretty small amount and then worldwide. Well, how does nuclear power work, right? How does a nuclear power plant get its energy from nuclear energy? Now, nuclear energy itself, just as the vocabulary term, this is the energy released by fission or fusion. Fission splitting apart, fusion pushing together. And this represents the binding energy of the atomic nucleus. Now, the forces that hold a atom together in the nucleus. So in the nucleus, we have protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are held very tightly and they're surrounded by the electrons. Well, the bond down here in the nucleus is like a million times stronger than the chemical bonds between atoms like H2O, hydrogen, oxygen. These are two atoms and they are chemically bonded. So those bonds are strong and when we break them like alcohol and we burn it and it releases, we get energy. Well, it's a million times stronger bond in the nucleus, much harder to break apart, but when it does, it releases a lot more energy. Nuclear power plants, atoms of the element uranium are used as the fuel. So we dig up uranium, it is just a mineral ore. Then we refine it, you know, just like we find gold ore. Well, it's mainly rock, you know, we have to refine it so I just have a lump of gold. We have to do the same thing with uranium. So until we get a lump of uranium. Now, then we take this piece of uranium, dig it out of the ground, send it off to a, a factory. It is enriched, put into a chunk of uranium. The nuclei of the uranium atoms are then bombarded with neutrons. We have, from the lab, we take neutrons, we kind of fire them out in a neutron gun. Now, neutrons are microscopic. They're really beyond microscopic. Our most powerful scanning, tunneling microscopes can only detect an atom. It just looks like a bit of a fuzzy ball. We can't see a nucleus. These things are subatomic, tiny. But we fire the neutrons at the nucleus and these collisions cause the nucleus to split into what we call nuclear fission. Nuclear fission, once again, is a vocabulary term. This is a splitting of the nucleus of a large atom into two or more fragments. And they're not really just fragments. What we do is we take a large atom and we split it in half and then we're left with two other atoms. So we take uranium and we create two different ones, like it could split into barium and krypton. There are several things that it can turn into. These are just two that can happen. When this occurs, nuclear fission releases a tremendous amount of energy and more neutrons, which in turn collide with more uranium nuclei. Let's take a look at this just as a diagram, and I'll kind of walk us through it. Now, we don't have an individual uranium atom out there. We have a whole big 
bar of uranium. Typically we do it in a tube. So I've got the solid chunk of uranium and we fire neutrons at this chunk. When it does, it'll hit a uranium nucleus. That uranium nucleus, typically uranium-235, splits apart. Now this diagram calls them daughter cells, but in fact, this could be something like one could be a barium atom, one could be a krypton atom. You know, once again, the number of protons in the nucleus dictates what the atom is. So just depending on how it randomly breaks off. Nucleus break off, but it also releases some extra neutrons from inside the nucleus. Nucleus 235 has got a lot of extra neutrons in there as well. Uranium is 92, so it's got 92 protons, but it's going to have more than 92 neutrons. So when it breaks apart, some neutrons fire off, and they fire off at virtually the speed of light. They, in turn, wind up hitting other uranium atoms, which are nearby because we're in a concentrated tube of it, releasing the energy, breaking apart, releasing more, and it's a chain reaction, as you can see. One breaks into two, but it releases several neutrons. Those neutrons hit others, which break apart, releasing more neutrons. So I could break apart one, then which in fact then breaks apart maybe three, and those three break apart nine, and a chain reaction. Every time one breaks apart, it releases the energy from the nucleus. Just like when I burn alcohol, I'm breaking the chemical bonds. Here, we're breaking the nuclei bonds. Much more powerful, much more energy. It is the heat that is released during the nuclear reactions that actually generates the electricity. That's how nuclear energy works we're still doing a very similar process. We're taking the heat to boil water. We boil water, we get steam. Steam spins the turbine. Still a very similar process to a coal-fired plant or a natural gas-fired plant. We're just using nuclear as the energy instead of coal as the energy, or even wood, you know, anything to boil the water. Let's go ahead and take a look at a diagram. This makes it a little easier. This should look incredibly similar to the one from before, because it really is. Now, instead of us having, you know, coal being dumped in and being burned, we just put in the uranium rods. Now, up on the top, it shows control rods. Control rods are absorbing some of these neutrons because the reaction could run so fast, it could heat up so much that it could cause a meltdown. It could get so hot that it could melt down through the chamber that it's in. So control rods are inserted or pulled out depending on how hot we need it to be. How much electricity are we trying to generate? You know, so we can use these control rods to absorb excess neutrons, but that's what they are. The water comes in, heat goes in, creates it into steam, steam goes out into our turbine, turbine spinning around, this in turn spins our electric generator, generating our electricity. Then the steam comes down, we condense it back into water, so that water stays in a closed loop because it can get exposed to this uranium, so that water stays in a closed loop. And then we have other that acts as a coolant because we have to keep this whole chamber cool. So nuclear power plants need a lot of water. Now the water that goes in to cool off this does not get radioactive. They're in different closed loops. So they're not mixing with each other. This is why there's no pollution with a nuclear power plant. Now there's pollution along the way because there's pollution when we build the plant, there's pollution when we're mining the uranium and we're refining the uranium. But once the uranium is brought into the completed plant, we're not producing any pollution. That big cooling tower, the smoke coming out of the cooling tower isn't smoke, it's steam. It's just water vapor because we're cooling this whole process down. So in all of our power plants, we have these cooling towers because we're having to cool everything off because we're heating everything to boiling. We're dealing with a lot of heat. Now, let's go ahead and talk advantages and some disadvantages. The advantages of nuclear power, it is a very concentrated energy cell. 
One bar about the size of my arm would power Gainesville for a decade. Uh, it's a major, it's a really highly controlled source. A little pellet, uh, I don't, I should have brought one in. Pellet is about the size of an eraser on a pencil. A pellet of uranium is about the same amount. So, you know, just this teeny tiny bit as two tons of coal. So I could fill this room with coal or I had one little pellet, equal amounts of energy. So it's a very concentrated energy source. Once again, we're not producing any air polluting gases. There's no carbon dioxide being released, no sulfur dioxide, no nitric oxides, no methane being involved. So it's a clean burning energy source. They actually release less radioactivity than a coal fire plant. Coal has been in the ground for a long time, millions of years, and it has some radioactivity in it. When we're burning it, that radioactive material gets vaporized and goes into the air. It's small amounts in the coal, but we're burning a lot of coal and it puts some radioactive elements up into the air. So coal actually releases more radioactive material onto the planet than does uranium, if it's operated properly. Now, countries with limited fossil fuels, you don't have coal and oil in the ground, so you got to buy it from everybody else. It's more expensive, right? Well, countries like this tend to rely more heavily on nuclear power. Japan was one of these. They relied heavily on nuclear power. After the Fukushima Daiichi accident, the tidal wave that crippled them, they've tried to back off some. But once again, this is just a source of energy for countries that don't have large amounts of fossil fuels. So for all these advantages, you know, very dense energy, no waste, high end. If you don't have other fossil fuels, it's a great source. Why don't we use more? Well, building and maintaining a safe reactor is incredibly expensive all of the safety features that have to go in place because we are talking about radioactivity. An accident at a coal plant isn't anywhere near as bad as an accident at a nuclear energy. So there's a lot more safety protocols involved. This makes building a nuclear plant uncompetitive with other energy sources. Much cheaper to build a coal plant or a natural gas plant. Today, much cheaper to put up a lot of windmill farms or solar instead of nuclear. The actual cost of a new nuclear power plant is uncertain. It's very difficult to predict for the investors how much it's gonna be. You wanna put a price tag on it? Somewhere between 10 and 20 billion dollars. This is not something a state can do. It has to be underwritten by the federal government. That's the only way we can build these. So they are incredibly expensive when we consider doing others. You're talking about $20 billion? We could put wind farms all up and down the coastline offshore of Florida for the same amount and get renewable energy for decades to come. It's just really hard to underwrite them. They're so expensive. So we don't have as many of them coming as line as was once thought in the 70s. Also, the greatest disadvantage of nuclear power is the difficulty of finding a safe place to store the nuclear waste. This gives us power for a decade, but once it's done, we can't really get enough heat to boil water. It's still radioactive it is still giving off radiation. The uranium still decaying. It doesn't all go away really quickly. How long does it last? Well, up to 240,000 years. If we do not take it and enrich it to pull the plutonium out, if we pull the plutonium out of it, then it only takes about 10,000 years that it's gotta be stored. Otherwise, it's 240. Of course, a problem if we pull the plutonium out, now that's weapons grade. So we can treat the uranium so that it lasts much less, but in doing that, we wind up with weapons grade plutonium. So uh, it's not something we really wanna just kind of give away the keys to nuclear weapons as easily. So anyway, normally about 240,000 years. Storage sites. 
they have to be located somewhere that's going to be geologically stable for tens of thousands of years. We can't put it somewhere, bury it in the ground, and then later a tectonic shift and there be an earthquake and then it breaks open and releases all the radiation. So we have to find sites. In America, we flag a place in the Yucca Mountains and we began to building a safe repository. We abandoned it. Currently in the United States, there are no permanent radioactive waste sites. So what do we do with it? Currently, it's just being stored at the sites of the nuclear power plants. We do not have a permanent repository. Part of the problem is where can we put it that we know it's going to be geologically stable for tens of thousands a year? And everybody says, not in my backyard. You know, a governor doesn't want to sign off that, yes, we will be the uranium waste of the planet. We just don't have any, even though everybody believes that's the best thing to do, it's just not being done. Now, we're researching ways to recycle the radioactive elements in the fuel, but once again, this is just one of the definitive problems that we have. In a poorly designed nuclear power plant, the fission process can potentially get out of control. One of the most famous was Chernobyl. Back in 1986, the Chernobyl reactor was destroyed. Level of some human error along with some uh, design flaws and an unauthorized test caused an explosion and blasted radioactive material into the air. And then we had a meltdown at it. In 2011, there was an unusually large earthquake and the tsunami overwhelmed safety measures in the Dakeishi Fukushima, Japan. And this plant, went off, several went off land because they didn't have power to run the cooling systems. They had multiple power plants that they were relying from, but when all of them went off at once because of the tidal wave, we had failures. Now, the amount of radiation that was released from the Daiichi plant was less than 10% of the levels it released from Chernobyl. We learned a lot from Chernobyl and we have improved our safety designs. In the United States, the most serious accident was in 1979. This was Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. Human error, along with some blocked valves and a broken pump was responsible. Once again, a meltdown. Now, fortunately, only a very small amount of the radioactive gas escaped. And since that accident, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has required a lot more safety improvements into the power plants. We have made them a lot safer, but they're also a lot more expensive. And this is part of the reason. The idea of the safety involved, the cost involved, what do we do with the nuclear waste when it's done? If we process the uranium so that it can be stored for a shorter amount of time, we're obtaining plutonium, which is getting into weapons grade. It's just a whole host of issues and problems that come with it. So because of this, what is the future of nuclear power? Well, one of the things that has been looked at is nuclear fusion. We talked about fission, splitting an atom. Fusion is pushing atoms together. Fission takes a very large atom, uranium, and breaks it apart. Fusion takes two very small atoms and pushes them together. It's fusion releases, once again, tremendous amounts of energy because that when the bond forms, it releases energy. So energy gets released when we break a bond or when we form a bond. Actually, we wind up getting more energy from the fusion than we do from fission. It's a potentially safer source than nuclear fission because it produces less radioactive byproducts. Just the process of it. The joining together produces less radioactive material than when we break it apart. Break it apart is a chain reaction that goes on and on and on. So here's the diagram of it. We take deuterium, the hydrogen with a neutron. Normally hydrogen is just hydrogen with one proton, one electron, no neutron. So deuterium is H2. It has a proton and a neutron. 
Tritium has two neutrons in it. What we do is these are forced together, fused together. It takes energy to do this, and then a neutron fires off, and we're left with helium-4. Two protons, two neutrons, a very stable atom, and the neutron fires off. The problem with fusion currently is the technical difficulty of achieving it is just too great. Currently, it's always negative net energy. It takes more energy to fuse the two together than we get back from the reaction. We can successfully do fusion, but it's a negative net energy loss. It takes more energy than we get out. We can't utilize that. Like with coal, you dig it up. It takes some energy to dig it up, but then we burn it, we get much more energy than it costs to dig it out of the ground. So it always takes some energy to get it with uranium. We have to dig it out of the ground, we have to mine it, we have to refine it, get it to the plant, but then when it's in the plant, it can run for years. With this, it's negative net. What we want is negative high. Negative medium is coal is a net high energy. Natural gas is net medium and oil is net medium to net low. It depends on the grade of, of it. But this is what we're, we need, what we're after, and it's just negative net currently. So the technical problems with building it just may take decades or it may never even happen. Spending millions and even billions of research to do it, and we're beginning to realize we're better off spending that money on technology we currently have and our renewables instead of putting it into something that just has so many known problems. The idea is we don't want to put all our eggs into one basket. If we just put all of our energy in wind or all of our energy into solar or all of it into hydroelectric our, or geothermal, these are all our renewables. What we want, we need to have a lot of everything because it's not always windy everywhere, right? It's not always sunny everywhere. So we have to have a lot of various options. So nuclear is part of the overall power plan but it's never gonna be the major part, if you will. So potential future fission nuclear power technologies include some ideas of light water reactors or high temperature gas reactors. We've even looked at making some portable module ones. So like if there's a national disaster, you know, the truck can just pull up with the reactor and provide power for the city for, you know, a couple of weeks, a month. Think like, you know, Hurricane Katrina. We could just take a portable nuclear plant there to provide power for the city. There's still ideas that we're looking at tossing around, but currently we're pretty much realizing the disadvantages are outweighing the advantages. So it's part of our energy package, but it's never really going to be the whole thing. Guys, that pretty much wraps it up for nuclear energy. Take care, and we'll see you next time.